Good evening. I'm very pleased to welcome you to this La Trobe Asia event, Democracy in Malaysia, Prospects and Possibilities. My name is Beck Strading. I'm the Executive Director of La Trobe Asia at La Trobe University. I would like to begin this event by acknowledging the elders of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional custodians of the land upon which La Trobe University sits. I would also like to pay respect to their people, both past and present, and extend that respect to any Indigenous Australians who are present tonight. La Trobe Asia is very proud of our efforts to engage the public in thoughtful discussion and debate and to deepen our knowledge and our understanding of the region in which we live. Malaysian politics appears to be experiencing a period of upheaval and uncertainty. In May 2018, Malaysians put an end to, uh, to 61 years of a United Malay national organisation monopoly on power by electing a new coalition. But three and a half years later, the UMNO is back. While Malaysia faces recovery from a devastating pandemic and the economic fallout from a lengthy lockdown, there also appears to be significant political challenges as the new Prime Minister, Ismail Sabri Yaqub, must manage a tenuous coalition whose support is crucial to government stability within a broader context of shifting allegiances. What do these political developments mean for Malaysia's long-term democratic prospects? I'm really delighted to be joined by an exceptional panel of experts to help unpack that question. Dr. Amrita Mali is a visiting fellow at the Coral Bell School of Asia Pacific Affairs at the Australian National University. Amrita is an historian of Southern, uh, Southeast Asia with a primary interest in Islam, shifting identities and identity conflict in colonial Malaya and contemporary Malaysia. Welcome Amrita. Professor James Chin is the Chair of Asian Studies at the University of Tasmania. He writes extensively on contemporary Malaysian politics. It's really terrific to have you here, James. And last but certainly not least, we have Associate Professor Kirsten Steiner, who is an academic and director of research in the La Trobe University's Law School. Kirsten specialises in Southeast Asian legal studies, researching at the intersection of law, politics, economics and society. Great to have you along as always, Kirsten. There will be an opportunity for audience Q&A in the last part of tonight's session. So please uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box as we go along through the event. And I will pose them to our panel in the last part of the session. Uh, but I wanna get straight into the discussion with you, James. Uh, Malaysia's new prime minister, Ismail, has a tenuous hold on leadership, as I said in the introduction. Uh, there's been three prime ministers since 2018. I'm wondering if you can begin our conversation by giving a brief overview of the state of Malaysian politics over the last couple of years, uh, as it can be quite complicated. Well, thank you very much, Beck, and thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this discussion on Malaysian politics. So I think the Malaysian story, as you mentioned, is a bit complicated. So I think we'll start with the regime change in 2018. So I think when that happened, I think there was a lot of uh, joy, a lot of optimism in Malaysia. People really thought that Malaysia has finally reached the stage where a democratic, a democratic transition was possible. And a lot of people at that time uh, gave the benefit of the doubt to Pakatan Harapan, the opposition alliance, even though it was led by Mahathir Mohamad. As many of the viewers know, Mahathir Mohamad was Malaysia's longest serving prime minister, but this time he came back uh, leading an, op an opposition alliance. And now, unfortunately, Pakatan Harapan's experiment with multiracial politics uh, lasted just two years because in 2020, uh, his uh, Pakatan Harapan basically fell apart. And it fell apart basically for three reasons. Uh, the first one is that uh, there was a lot of political tensions in the government because uh, Mahathe refused to hand power over to uh, his successor, Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, depends on who you speak to. Apparently, there was a political deal done where Anwar is supposed to take over from Mahathe uh, 
uh, two years after uh, 2018, in other words, in 2020. Uh, the second reason was that because the opposition alliance came together sort of at the very last minute, uh, when they got into government, basically each of the parties, the major parties, Pakatan Harapan, were basically doing their own things. So, for example, Mahathir's party, Besatu or PPBM, was basically uh, you know, running the government like uh, AMNO, the previous uh, party in power. Uh, DAP was trying to promote a more or less uh, racial approach, more inclusive, less racial approach to government. And the third uh, governing party, Amada, was trying to position itself to replace PAS. So basically, each of those parties were doing their own thing. So there was a lot of uh, dysfunction. Uh, the third reason why it fell apart was uh, essentially uh, the opposition, AMNO, for the first time in AMNO's history, they decided to work with the Islamic party past. If you look at the history of Malaysia, uh, it was always widely understood in the Malay community that you only had two real choices. If you're sort of a Malay nationalist, a small Islamist, you sort of join AMNO. If you believe that Malaysia should head towards the Islamic path and become more Islamic, you join PAS. So it was quite incredible after 2018, these two core Malay parties uh, you know, got together and they had a very, very powerful narrative against the Pakatan Harapan government, which was that the Malay and Islam were being marginalized. So with all this pressure in the background, basically the government fell apart uh, initially, Mahathir thought that he could control the situation by coming back and creating a new government, what he calls a government national unity. But this was a government national unity with minimum participation of the non -Malays. But of course, we know that he lost the plot and his party abandoned him, his own party, Kobusato, abandoned him. And instead, they elected his deputy, uh, Muyadin Yasin, to be uh, the new prime minister. And that was in 2020. Muyadin's uh, government basically uh, projected itself as a very Malay-centric or Malay-first government, and it basically consists of three core Malay parties. AMNO, the party that it deposed in 2018, Bersatu, Mahathe Ex Party, and PAS, the Islamic party. Uh, so they came in initially, they had lots of support in the Malay community, but because of the onset of the COVID crisis, uh, they began to lose their plot and they began to lose support. But eventually this year, the government fell apart. And this is where the story becomes very complicated, but also very interesting. The government fell apart because the former prime minister, Najib Razak, uh, the man who the world associates with 1MDB, he made a big comeback this year, together with his successor, Amno, a guy called Zai Hamidi. They got together and pulled down Muyadin Yassin's government because Muyadin refused uh, to do their bidding. So basically what happened was that after 2018, when Pakatan Harapan took over, they took a series of legal actions against uh, Najib and several senior people Amno who were involved in uh, 1MDB plus other sort of uh, corruption uh, things in Malaysia. So because Muyadin Yasin refused to deal with this group, uh, they decided to pull down the government. So now we're in a funny situation where uh, Ismail Sabri from Amno. Uh, is now in charge of this new government, but he is also a very weak leader because uh, their majority in parliament, as I understand it, is between two or three. So what happened was that when he got into power in August this year, uh, the first thing he did was that he made peace with Najib and uh, Zahid. Uh, you know, Muyadin Yassin refused to make peace with them. Uh, he made peace with them, so he has a full support arm now. But more importantly, he reached across the aisles and did a MOU, a political MOU with the opposition to keep his government in power. So the easiest way of understanding the current administration is Mount Sabri government is one, it is still a very Malay-centric, Islamic-centric government. Secondly, it is basically a government of convenience. It's basically there uh, until the next general election. And that's the reason why he's willing to sign an MOU with the opposition. Everybody's in the holding pattern and everyone's preparing for GE15. And the third and perhaps the most important point, and that is, uh, although everyone is preparing for GE15, uh, the economy is getting worse and worse. And because of that, I suspect the elections will be held uh, earlier rather than later. Officially, according to uh, the rules of parliament, election doesn't have to be held until 2023, but I suspect elections will be held in 2022, uh, the second half of next year. Uh, so that's basically a very brief summary from me.
a tremendous job. Uh, and you mentioned both the worsening economic situation, but you also uh, briefly touched on, on COVID and uh, Muhyiddin's um, handling of the COVID-19 state of emergency uh, is reported in the press as being one of the reasons why his prime ministership ended. So I'm wondering how has the pandemic affected Malaysian politics and society? Well, uh, my argument is that the COVID thing, uh, in fact, was, was a, a plus factor for Muyading. Because if you remember, when he came to power in March 2020, uh, that was when the world was heading towards lockdown. So one of the things he did was immediately suspend parliament using COVID as the excuse. So in fact, COVID uh, allowed him to do a lot of what Malaysians call monkey business. Because the moment he shut down government, it means he was in full control uh, of the administration. And we know that after they, they lifted the state of emergency, uh, we know that he spent a lot of money on, on, on things that he should not be spending money. So for example, uh, instead of spending money to pop out the economy, a lot of the money went into political projects. So that's the reason why I think uh, the Malaysian economy is in big, big trouble now. A lot of people do not realize how serious the economy is. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, Although the official figure is that the, the economy contracted by about 10%, when I speak to my uh, uh, business friends in Malaysia, most of them tell me the figure is closer to a quarter. 25% of the economy has just disappeared. So if they don't revive the economy this year, I think we can expect uh, real political tensions in the system uh, coming next year. And we might get back to some forecasting later on in the event, but um, Rita, let's uh, sort of turn our attention to the past. As a historian, how can we place these political developments in a historical context? Are these consistent features of Malaysian politics? Well, look, it's a, it's a great question. And I've thought about it actually, you know, quite a lot lately because, you know, obviously watching uh, the Pakatan Harapan government essentially collapse itself, you know, due to the pressures that James uh, outlined, you know, the, the question has kind of come up, I suppose, because there was genuinely some enthusiasm. I mean, I, I don't want to overplay the enthusiasm when um, when Amno fell, when Barisan National fell, because it was, it was a partial kind of response, right? Like it wasn't a whole of society, you know, rejoicing or anything like that. But I think that's the key, right? So if we summarise James's summary, essentially, you know, what we've got is a situation where all these alliances are shifting and changing because there is a uh, an effort on to attempt to regroup the Malay Muslim majority that has historically kept UMNO in power. Now, that majority is not a natural one. It doesn't just automatically exist. It's got to be created and recreated and constructed and reconstructed using various te techniques and, and tactics of of power, I guess. And so that's where, uh, you know, if we look at the past, we can actually see quite a consistent pattern. Um, and it actually goes back to, you know, the independence of Malaya, which we now refer to as Peninsula Malaysia in 1957. So even after, you know, the fuller Malaysia was formed in 1963, the Malayan pattern seems to have determined uh, the direction of federal politics whenever there's a multiracial challenge. So essentially, you know, there's a, uh, the, the pattern is that there's a surge of multiracial politics built by individuals and organizations and members of the public who know that that is their path to reform. So that's the way they're going to organize and that's the way they're going to try and push uh, for change. And, and when I say multiracial, what I mean by that is that members of all of Malaysia's so-called races uh, participate in politics on the basis of a kind of a shared civic nationalism or a public citizenship. Now, usually what happens is that surge starts to become threatening to establish political elites, mm -hmm. usually because it gains the capacity to split that carefully cultivated Malay Muslim majority. So when it does that, it starts to become, you know, seriously threatening to established elites. And generally what happens is it's beaten back by a process of racial and religious mobilization that uses whatever means it has as it's at its disposal to derail the multiracial push. And that's where... Um, you know, the forces in Parliament kind of are right now, like they're trying to find a way to just hold on and get ready for that push to come at the next election or, or some other some other means. Um, and so very often that beating back tends to take place under the cover that's created by calling an emergency, just as the state did last year, just as it did for two years after the 1969 election, which is another example. Uh, and, and the racial pogrom that followed, and just as it did for 12 years from 1948 to 1960, just as Malaysia, the nation, or Malaya, the, the independent colony, was, was being designed. Um, and so usually what happens is that push tends to portray multiracialism 
as a, an attempt by Malaysia's racial minorities, usually Chinese, to usurp Malay Muslims' purportedly rightful place as Malaysia's supreme race. And so the argument goes, the fact that that majority can be split at all means that it has to be pulled back together again by any means necessary so that its internal divisions are papered over and those internal divisions are serious and evident and in part structured by the economic collapse that we've you know, witnessed in Malaysia. You know, I think the politics of precarity and uh, unemployment and, uh, and you know, falling incomes and all those things I think are going to be actually very important. But the attempt, of course, is to kind of paper over those divisions and use race as the key wedge. Uh, and so usually what happens is a period in which racial and religious identity becomes really salient because that's the way, you know, the, the forces uh, that are threatened are going to put their majority back together again. So, you know, I've, I've got an article coming out on um, the 1948 to 60 emergency uh, in a history journal called Itinerario. It's coming out later this month. And, and there I look at that, that process of, you know, a surge of multiracial politics. Uh, and in fact, in that case, it was quite a violent pushback. It was, you know, a full scale war that they called an emergency. Um, you know, subsequent emergencies have not used anywhere near as much violence. In 1969, one pogrom was enough. This time around, there hasn't been a need for any violence. There have been other means at the state's disposal. But ultimately, what's happened in each case is a new kind of racial mobilization, a new uh, rewriting of the kind of the racial contract, right, which uh, Malay nationalists love to refer to. They call it the social contract. They don't call it the racial contract. But that is, in fact, how Malaysian society is organized as a, you know, a group of races that the British constructed and left behind for us. And then we've all got to carry those racial labels around and, and live with those things, you know, until, until the end of time by the look of it. And so politically, that's very useful, right? So that's the pattern. Yeah, so you've kind of preempted my, my next question here because I am really interested in the role of identity, particularly Islam, in contemporary Malaysian uh, political system. It seems from what you're saying uh, that it really is one of the central features in understanding Malaysian politics. You really need to understand um, how race and how religion works within that society. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, sure I can. And, and I, uh, you know, I've got to say that sometimes, you know, discussions about race can lead to a certain squeamishness. When, when we look at Malaysian society, we have to kind of get over that and, and accept that indeed this is the way society is structured. And it's um, something that is constantly reinforced in part through the use of religiosity, right? So I guess before I go on, I should probably, you know, just make it really clear that I'm not talking about personal piety or belief, um, but rather the way that identity and religion are deployed and mobilized in the context of the political system. And as I said before, the reason it's so um, uh, kind of salient, the reason it's so easy to turn into a really useful wedging device uh, is because of the need to continually reshore up that uh, Malay Muslim majority. And so the fact that you know, Muslims, uh, Malays are by definition in the federal constitution Muslim means that other Muslims who aren't Malays aren't important, ultimately, the usefulness of, of religion is that it, it happens to overlap almost squarely uh, with the category Malay. So the racial and the religious, they, they allow a certain kind of slipperiness, a certain slippage. The state uses that slippage to, to kind of have more resources at its disposal to keep on shoring up that, that majority. Um, so basically religion is a rich resource uh, that the state can mine, I guess, to help ensure that that majority keeps on cohering around the central pole of attraction. And that's not actually that easy. There are lots of other influences in society, lots of other um, opportunities for people to look in other directions. Uh, as we have both mentioned, you know, um, the, that Malay majority is actually internally, it's quite differentiated. You know, there are differences of class, there are differences of kind of lifestyle, of, of interest, of exposure to to other influences. Everybody is, of course, exposed to all sorts of global influences. But what's attractive is not always the same a lot of things. So, you know, you have some people looking to the Muslim world, you have some people looking to, you know, attractive things from the West. And there's a lot of, there's quite a soft power contest in terms of where people's attention is. Um, but the state will always make sure that it is to some extent focused on, on Islam and the need to cohere together. And I'll give you a really good recent example of how that sort of thing is done. It's it's, uh, it's done using the classic tools of the culture war, right? So, you know, there are examples from all around the world of, of you know, governments effectively using culture to wedge uh, the population. And, and there's been this just example just recently of this whiskey bottle. Um, I don't know if you followed this back, but certainly I'm, I'm sure the others on the panel have, but um, essentially there's a brand of whiskey. It's called Thima, it's made in Malaysia. 
there are some doubts as to whether it's actually whiskey or not because of how it's made, but I, I don't actually know the technical details. The main thing is the name and the label. It's called Thima, which is the Malay word for tin. Uh, and now, of course, the reason, you know, the Malay states were such attractive colonies to Western powers in the first place is because they had all these raw materials, including tin. So it's kind of like a throwback to, you know, that legacy. So it's got a guy with a beard on the label and it's called Thima. And this has been seized upon by, you know, God knows who, cyber troopers on the internet, uh, as an example of nefarious alcohol dealers trying to draw Muslims into consuming alcohol. Because Thima could be read, if you were particularly obtuse, as a shortening of the name of the Prophet Muhammad's daughter Fatima, if you wanted to. You probably wouldn't, but you could if you wanted to. And the guy with the beard, well, he could be a Muslim, he's got a beard. He's actually um, a British colonial official. Uh, and, and so, you know, this thing has been kind of chewed up and, you know, turned into fodder in the media as a way to problematize and make into a controversy the fact that there's alcohol produced and sold to non-Muslims and tourists and whatever in Malaysia. And so that's been through the ringer in the media. Uh, in the end, the whiskey brand is actually seems to have won the culture war. It's not going to change its name. But this is how, you know, attention is kind of drawn to questions of, you know, who is actually threatening you? Is it non-Muslims threatening you? Is it Chinese, uh, et cetera? So, you know, this goes on just on and on and on with example after example. And um, it's just a constant process of making sure that people's attention is constantly focused towards who its threat is and its threat must be internal. It must be minorities and that's how it works. Fascinating. I wasn't expecting to be discussing culture wars over whiskey. So I've learned <laughs> something Definitely learn something new uh, tonight. But Kirsten, I might uh, take the conversation over to you uh, with a deceptively straightforward question. Is Malaysia a democracy? Well, thanks a lot, Beck, for this, this question. I have to say, when, when I got this question, I thought, hmm, that is, that is seriously a hot potato that she's thrown to me. And I'm not sure whether this is, can be entangled in, in the allocated time. So I do my best. So please bear with me for, for a moment. So if there are numerous definitions of what a democracy is, I'm not going into this. We are sticking to the most basic one, which is saying a form of government in which people choose their leaders by voting. And as James um, summarized beforehand, well, Malaysia does choose their leaders by voting, not in the past three years, but before it. So the 2018 election was a clear sign that yes, governments who have been in power for a very long time can be kicked out of power. However, if you're looking at numerous surveys and the Economist Intelligence Unit Democracy Index is one, and it classifies Malaysia as a flawed democracy. The uh, Freedom House, um, which is coming out of the US, is also saying Malaysia is partly free as a democracy. And this is really where we are getting into the challenge of the democracy, the simple definition. Because if we're looking at three key areas, so we might look first at the election. Do we have free and fair elections with possibility of regime change? As history has shown us, yes, we do. We do have, of course, challenges in the electoral system, and I'm not glossing them over, but unlike Singapore, we did have a change in regime. The second one is the freedom and protection of civil liberties, and this is a really challenging issue, particularly in a multiracial country, as Amita explained to us, because what you have to look at is the main influence. And is Amrita did a fantastic job of pulling Islam out of this. And a lot of those challenges are coming out of the relationship between the state and Islam. Is it an Islamic state? Is it not an Islamic state? And in the question of human rights, we all we have the classic problems there of Islam and challenges of rec reconciling them with certain human rights, such as family law, gender equality, LGBT rights, freedom of religion, criminal laws, etc. The list goes on and on. 
we also have issues in Malaysia in regards to freedom of the media and reporting. We have issues in regards to human trafficking, where the US has just downgraded Malaysia to the worst tire in its annual report. Um, and we do have issues of police corruption and excessive use of force and the complaints mechanism. So we've got a, a fair number of, of human rights issues that show that this democracy does have indeed some issues. We also have the, the issue of the rule of law and in particularly an independent judiciary that protects these freedoms and holds governments and officials accountable. And while we have seen improvements there, and I'm delighted to, to a certain degree with the decisions being handed down by the higher courts this year, we've got um, court, the courts being extremely courageous, um, passing down decisions in contested religious and political matters, um, particularly this year. So please do me a favor, ask me about this if you want to see me seriously excited. Um, we also have the question of whether we can detangle the executive and the judiciary. And James um, flagged that. So one of the reasons why we had the, the change in government was because of the 1MDB scandal. And what the 1MDB scandal showed us was um, that we had an, such a tangled up mess of executive politics, economics, and judiciary that internal investigations weren't going anywhere. With the change in elect with the change in power um, due to the election, that mess got slightly detangled. It still has its problem, but it got slightly detangled. So there are positive signs for democracy, but the question is, are we, are we staying on this trajectory or are we diverting again? And that is, that is something that is really hard to say. Yeah, there seems to be this kind of awkward trend of, you know, 61 years of, of no change in government. And now there's like a lot of change uh, going on. And is there a kind of happy medium? And, 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 and is that necessary, I guess, for uh, democracy? But I did want to ask you, uh, Kirsten, about uh, the political, uh, about corruption and the role uh, that 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 plays in Malaysian politics. The one MBD is, has been a sprawling saga, I think, um, that many of us would, uh, are familiar with. Uh, but uh, you kind of touched on it in your response. Uh, but how is this affecting rule of law? And then what kind of consequences does that have for democracy? Mm -hmm. I think it, it is, a, again, a really good question. For me, it is, well, is what role is playing corruption playing in Malaysian politics or what role is politics playing in cases of corruption? Um, so I think I would slightly re reorder this because I think the one MDB scandal really illustrates this point for us. Um, we can now divide it into two phases, let's put it this way, the pre-election phase and the post-election phase, if you want to, and what's happening next with the third phase is coming up because as James mentioned, well, Najib might make a comeback. So in the pre-election phase, it was clear that corruption cases are not going to be investigated if there is no political will. Um, while the rest of the world was heavily investigating um, issues with one MDB and its investments, uh, Malaysia put up a firewall around one MDB and national investigations weren't moving a bit. Now, following the election, and 1MDB was indeed an issue during the election campaigns. It, I'm not arguing that it was the main contributor to, to have this change in regime, but it did contribute to the regime change. Following this, we, we saw clear signs that things are moving along. Um, Najib was quickly charged and in 2020 found guilty of one count of abuse of power, uh, three counts of criminal breach of trust, three counts of money laundering, etc. Et now, currently, the sentence is being appealed by both sides and the hearing has just been postponed. So wait, wait for it. 
the interesting part with the with the on hold pattern is now um, a statement by the prime minister in August, where he basically said that he received pressure from particular parties to intervene in court matters as a way to exonerate several unnamed individuals from criminal charges. That was in August, while the the appeal decision to to stay proceedings, etc., was was handed down in late July. So there is a fair bit of, of time linkage that we could um, construct, even though he never named names, um, but that we could construct to, to that deg degree. If that's the case, well, it is interesting because it shows that the culture really hasn't changed. If we are still believing that the executive, that it is appropriate by uh, political officials to put pressure on these types of um, investigations and proceedings in, in front of the courts. Other positive signs is the inclusion of corporate co corruption in the Malaysian uh, Anti-Corruption Commission Act, which is mostly needed, but it didn't address and it and these amendments really fell short when it came to government linked companies GLCs. And while they are now liable for punishment if their employees are associated in crimes of corruption, it is still a problem of selective enforcement and prosecution when it comes to these part of governments. So going with corruption. Right track? Probably. Are we going well because of the changes, despite of the changes, or regardless of the changes? These are our three options. And I am not sure whether I can make a judgment call on this yet, to be quite honest. Thank you so much. Very interesting. I did want to. Uh... Before I, I take the conversation back to, to James, uh, just say, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I see that we have one in there. I've got a couple more to pose to our panellists, uh, but it would be great to see some more questions in the Q&A box. But James, you mentioned that there's somewhat of a holding pattern at the moment, uh, and you mentioned that a prediction uh, that elections will uh, may be held uh, in the second half of next year. So I wanted to ask you about your views uh, having heard that the, the other panelists uh, uh, talk about uh, various issues related to Malaysia's uh, democracy, what are your views on Malaysia's long-term democratic prospects? So uh, my view is probably uh, uh, not the popular view. Uh, my view is that uh, uh, everything depends on, on, on two issues. The first is something that Amitra has, has uh, raised, which is the issue of political Islam. Political Islam will have a major impact on which direction Malaysia will take. Uh, the second thing I'd like to remind your viewers is that if there's going to be any political change, any forms of reforms, it has to come from the Malay establishment itself. I have to use my word very carefully. I'm not talking about the Malay population or the Malay polity. I'm talking about the Malay establishment. The Malay establishment is a very unique creature in the Malaysian context. Uh, in some ways, it's very similar to the Thai establishment because there's also an element of royalty influence in that establishment as well. So it has to come from, from either political Islam or uh, the rise of political Islam or the Malay establishment itself. Uh, my take is that uh, the next election, the next general election is crucial in that it will signal which way Malaysia will be going. So the best way to describe what is happening now, besides the holding pattern now, is that uh, you have to understand in the Malaysian context, one of the reasons why Barisan National was such a stable coalition and everybody, you know, looked past its, its uh, you know, its, uh, uh, what do you call it, its problem with racial politics, religious politics, you know, the rest of the world is in non-Malaysia for a very long time, despite the fact that you had lots of institutional problems in Malaysia, including institutional racism. Everyone, in fact, said Malaysia was a great country was a good model for, for you know, a multi-racial population. One of the reasons why Barisan National was such a stable form of government was because you only had one core Malay party in the coalition, the ruling coalition, 
but you can have multiple parties representing anybody under the sun. So at the height of Barisan National, you had one core Malay party, AMNO, but you had 13 other political parties representing the Chinese, the tribal groups, anything you want, not a problem. But the core party is AMNO. Now, what has happened since 2018 is that this model is completely broken because now you have two core Malay parties, right? Versatu, which was set up by Mate, then Dam Mate, and AMNO. Both of them are trying to compete each other. So there's an old Chinese saying that for a small mountain, you can only afford to keep one tiger. So the question is that which tiger is going to run Malaysia? Because obviously you can't have two strong core Malay parties in the same government. And that's exactly what you're seeing now. You've got Besatu on the one hand and AMNO on the other hand, both trying very hard to control the federal government. And that's the reason why at the state level with the upcoming Malacca elections, they're fighting each other to see who can you know, who has the upper hand in terms of the Malay votes. Now, in the next general election, if there is a clear winner among the Malay votes, I'm not talking about non-Malay votes, among the Malay votes, right? If AMNO comes out very clearly the winner or the Besatu comes out very clearly the winner, then we will be slowly moving back to this sort of Barisan national type of system where inside the coalition, one core Malay parties and multiple other parties representing all sorts of groups. So if you can get that sort of results, we'll probably have a stable system moving forward. Now, in the next election, if we have a split in the Malay vote, like what we saw in 2018, then unfortunately, we will see another period of political instability. And the most important political force during a period of instability will be political Islam. Uh, and Marita, I'm going to ask the, the pose the same question to you. Uh, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic about long term democratic prospects? Or, you know, maybe there's a question about whether such a, a concept is even sort of appropriate for the kind of political system that we're talking about here. Yeah, look, I mean, I think there's there's a couple of parts to the answer. I mean, I suppose you know, where, uh, look, I, I hesitate to make predictions because I have to work historically, right? Um, but at the same time, it is possible to see what the parties are trying to do. I mean, they are, as James mentioned, uh, trying to organise things and regroup so that there is only one tiger on the, on the Malay mountain. Uh, and the reason they have to do that is usually after multiracial alternatives are pushed back, um, there's a process of rewriting the rules, as I mentioned, you know, rewriting the kind of the racial settlement. And then what usually happens after that is a kind of, you know, it's, it settles down. So essentially, you know, after provoking the kind of the racial wedge and, and the, you know, the shoring up of the majority and the marginalizing of the minority, things settle down in the form of, I guess, a consociational agreement. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, uh, the various races that exist in, in Malaysia, their elites uh, essentially bash out a, another settlement and, and they figure out another way of operating and and generally they form something like the Barisan National, which means of course the National Front, the National Front of Malaysia's races, um, which is you know essentially what that is is referring to. So if that is possible um, this time around, then I guess it will stabilize. Will it be more democratic? Well, I mean, the functions of a democracy will still exist. The trappings of a democracy will still exist. There will still be people voting, um, you know, as Kirsten uh, pointed out. And I think the fact that the Malaysian elite wants Malaysia to be viewed as a democracy, it wants those trappings, it wants those institutions. I think that that want is in itself a constraint against just dumping them. Uh, in order to kind of create a new uh, settlement or inner an Islamic state or whatever it might be. Uh, and that will probably provoke them to try and do what Mateo did for all those years in his last uh, experience as, as prime minister, which was essentially keep those Islamists on the margin uh, while telling non-Malays uh, and non-Muslims, I will protect you from them. Uh, so vote for me always, never vote for anybody else and I will protect you from them. Uh, and to Malays, I will make you rich uh, you know, riding the wave of economic growth by the new economic policy. Uh, and so he was kind of able to use economic growth and his kind of stable position uh, as the, the leader of that national front. He was able to kind of use it to dish out a little bit to everyone. Um, and even though society was being restructured in the background, everyone was still getting a bit. Now with the economy the way it is, I don't know if that's actually possible to organise. Um, you know, and I, and I don't know if Malaysia will follow that historical Malaya-Malaysia pattern that I pointed to before, or whether something new will happen 
uh, entirely, but but I can see what they're trying to do. They are trying to go back to something resembling a Barisan national. Uh, it will have a new name, it will have new characters, you know, they'll all have fought with each other, they'll all make up, uh, you know, factions will split and factions will realign and that'll all go on and that's where the complicated, you know, the, the annoying kind of complicatedness of it comes from. But ultimately, what's underlying all of that is, is yes, you know, they're, they are looking for a way to go back to a stable settlement and, and they haven't found it. So that's where the unpredictability comes in, right? Absolutely. Uh, Kirsten, I'll bring you into the conversation here. What are your thoughts on the future? I, I agree with, with both James and Amrita on this, and I might have another factor of unpredictability that we haven't touched upon, and that is that we potentially have 7.8 million new voters in the next election because um, Malaysia had um, on the, on the books to lower the age of, of the voting age from 21 to 18. And the government had tried to be postpone this and, and, and push it away. So what we saw then was, was young potential voters going on the street, a lot of protests on this one. And now, in fact, we do have the court is ordering the government to be implementing those changes by December, 31st of December this year. So for the new election, we will have those voters and those voters that are politically um, active and that are protesting are usually crossing those um, those political borderlines and, and issues. They are, uh, um, they are a different type of, of, of voters than we've seen beforehand. So it's going to be really interesting to see whether they will be able to influence the upcoming in elections and where their votes will fall because they do not have those traditional alliance that we, we had to other youth organizations by political parties, etc. Well, a whole lot of them are not um, organized along those lines. Fascinating. Uh, thank you. Uh, I can see we have a few more questions in the, the uh, Q&A box. So, James, I might direct the first one to you. It's very, uh, you know, very straightforward question. What's happened to Anwar and why? Did you want to take this question? So what happened to Anwar? So Anwar got played. He got played by Mahathir. He got played by part of the Malay establishment. So when uh, Mahathir refused to hand over power to Anwar, uh, Anwar basically tried to regroup and tried to uh, make a stake, a claim on the prime ministership. But I think uh, for the last two years, he has lost a lot of credibility because in the last three years, uh, he has said on three major occasions, including holding press conferences, saying that he had the numbers to form a new government. And each time uh, it was found that he did not have the numbers uh, to form a new government. Uh, it is also widely expected, well, this is what I've been told in Malaysian political circles, that if he were to lead the opposition into the next general election, GE15, uh, this will be his last chance uh, to be the prime minister of Malaysia. Uh, but uh, it is my prediction that he will never, uh, he will never be prime minister because if he were to lead the coalition into the next general election, uh, my take at the present moment is that Pakatan Harapan will lose if he's the leader of Pakatan Harapan. Uh, thank you. The next question uh, is to you, Amrita. There is a, a question about uh, the use of the term pogrom, which is associated with a particular uh, set of circumstances. So there's a question here about the evidence around an organised massacre of an ethnic group in 1969 and who organised it. So I think this is a good opportunity to sort of dig back into uh, history here uh, and, and tell us that story. Well, it's a massively disputed question. Um, so essentially, who organised it? Well, there are two versions of the story. Uh, you know, it's it's sensitive and disputed. Uh, essentially, the kind of the official version of the story is that um, after essentially the the DAP now you know in in headlights again as as having um, you know split the Malay majority in 2018 as well. Um, but essentially, you know, the minority parties managed to um, uh, kind of you know surge in a multiracial kind of victory to deny the then alliance uh, its two-thirds majority in parliament. So the alliance is the predecessor of the National Front. It's a similar idea. You know, the three races get together and its elites uh, form, a, form a front. 
so that uh, was the last time a, a kind of a really dominant parliamentary majority was challenged. And so the uh, the story goes um, that there were, you know, there was there were marches through the streets, and you know there was too much exuberant um, uh, celebration, uh, and as a result, there was a backlash, a violent backlash against Chinese people in Kuala Lumpur. Um, there is also another version out there which is disputed, and you know, it's it's kind of um, it hasn't really had a lot of attention, and I I imagine that's because it's sensitive. Uh, which is that actually the whole thing was, you know, orchestrated uh, as a kind of a, a response to that uh, surge of multiracial politics and to that electoral denial of the of the supermajority uh, by people who were affiliated with the ruling party. I don't know if that's true. I haven't looked at it. I haven't tested it. Uh, but I can say that these versions are kind of floating around out there and they are highly, highly sensitive. Um, it is true that our after that round of violence, whether we call it a pogrom or not, you can call it a race riot, that's usually how it's referred to. It's a bit less sensitive if you call it a riot, it makes it sound more spontaneous. Uh, and like I say, it's disputed. Um, but there is, a, you know, certainly the reality that after that an emergency was called, uh, a National Consultative Council was formed of, you know, of, um, you know, uh, elites and, and their sort of government state appointees. Uh, meetings were held of the, you know, the various races, um, you know, a new settlement was thrashed out and a new settlement was delivered in the form of the new economic policy. So, you know, how we talk about it is going to be a complicated issue. I can't resolve it in my answer to this question, uh, but it does point to a certain kind of pattern of, you know, a surge of, uh, of, of, of new politics that was new at the time uh, and then a kind of a, a backlash and a, a new settlement. So that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, the next question I will direct to you, Kirsten. Uh, it's given what you know about other regimes around the world, will the schism between Malay voter communities reach an uncomfortable boiling point? So again, we get back to that question, tensions between different political communities and what that might mean for stability. Mm -hmm. And, and I think the, the next question actually is, is putting it to the boiling point itself, isn't it? When, when it is asked, uh, should non-Malays who work hard and taxpayers get out of the country? Um, I, I would hope not. Um, um, I, it is an uncomfortable situation when you do have these these tensions coming coming head and when when the pendulum is, is swinging from from one side to another. Um, but when it comes to political Islam, for instance, and this this would be the the boiling point, as James probably also hinted at, if if we have the pendulum swinging towards the political Islam. Um, we, we might see see more of, of an issue there, but so far Malaysia has has avoided going too what I would call too far to the extreme, and the recent also the court decisions which I alluded to are giving me a bit of comfort in this because when we have this pendulum swinging it's also how the judiciary is recalibrating it and the question becomes what's higher the constitution or Islamic law and that has been a tension within the judiciary quite quite often and I'm, I'm, I'm taking quite hard that the judiciary right now as I see it with its decision is swinging to towards the end of constitutional rights and the constitution is the founding part of it and Islamic law is, is taking to a, to a degree a subservient role of, towards it. And, and that for me shows that we will have protection of the non-Malays, which in some at some point in time was not so clear when it came came to, to their rights and their civil liberties of whether they will be protected or not. Based on, on the current jurisprudence, as I, I see coming out of the courts, the courts are saying it very serious and it is clear constitution above everything else. I might stick with you for the minute because we're talking about the constitution, but an element of Malaysian uh, politics is that it is a constitutional monarchy. Uh, so I'm wondering what role has, has the, the monarch or the, uh, the royal family been playing in Malaysian politics of late? Uh, 
Oh, it, it's, a, it's a good one because what we also have, it, it is a constitutional monarchy, but it is unlike any other constitutional monarchy in, in the sense that it is a rotating constitutional monarchy, right? Um, we do not have uh, one royal family as such, we do have the different royal families of the states and the monarch is coming then out of the different, uh, different states. Um, the monarch, of course, has has an important role to play and has been playing an important role when it when it came to political stability and also uh, trying to to negotiate or navigate the different political lines. Some of them were, were much better in in doing this than others, no doubt about this. And there have always been big. Um, issues in regards to how much political power should they be exercising compared to should they be much more of a ceremonial role, etc. Um, so it, it is it is a very, very tricky, tricky one. Uh, James, uh, there is a the question here. Uh, and I, I, I'm glad that it is in here because I was actually um, wanting to ask something uh, a little bit similar is that, of course, there is a, an international context um, for, for the things that are happening in Malaysia in particular when it comes to um, global democracy. You know, there's a rise of populism. There's, uh, you know, a decline in democracy across the region, uh, you know, for the last 15, 16 years that's being tracked. So I'm wondering whether there's a relationship between the kind of international context and what we see in Malaysia's domestic politics. Uh, but the question here is also about Asia Pacific international relations and whether there is also an effect on bilateral relationships, so particularly between uh, Australia and Malaysia relations. So I know I've given you a little bit there to discuss. Uh, thank you very much. So um, Australia's relationship with Malaysia will not change for the foreseeable future. Australia's relationship with Malaysia has always been stable. And part of the reason why it's been stable is because I think uh, there's a lot of uh, people to people uh, contacts between Malaysia and Australia. As you know, for many, many uh, years, Malaysian students have been coming to Australia to study. Uh, the first big group came during the Colombo plan years. Uh, they went back to Malaysia. A lot of are holding senior positions. That, uh, so they always had a very positive view of Australia. So on top of that, uh, Malaysia and Australia also share the same British heritage and that led to a thing called Five Powers Defence Pact. So the Australian troops has always been in Malaysia, especially in Penang, uh, since Malaysia's independence. So there's always been these very deep links between uh, Malaysia and Australia. Uh, these links are independent of whoever is in government. Uh, so I don't expect uh, uh, things to be rocky between Malaysia and Australia. In recent years, I think, uh, especially under the previous High Commissioner, in fact, the relationship moved to a, what they call a comprehensive strategic relationship. So in fact, it, it is sort of on track, moving up every few years. So uh, relationship is very, very stable. Uh, I don't expect any, any major upheavals you know, for the foreseeable future. Um, the second question uh, you were asking was about, oh, the regional stuff. <laughs> The where more does Malaysia... international context yeah, the more, around yeah. democracy, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, where does Malaysia say all of this? I think for a very long time, uh, not only the general public, but also scholars have always put Malaysia and Singapore together. Uh, these are two sort of a single uh, party, soft authoritarian uh, states where, you know, we know that who's going to win the elections all the time, even though that, uh, I mean, the best way to describe it is that these are really hybrid states. They have elements of democratic norms about them, but they also have a lot of elements of authoritarian rule as well. Malaysia sort of broke that model in 2018, but we sort of, you know, a lot of us think that it's actually making a comeback now. There's a correction uh, being held. So everyone is looking towards Singapore and the questions being asked is that, you know, in the next few general elections in Singapore, will the Singaporeans do the Malaysian thing? Like what happened in 2018? Throw the PAP out and see what happens. So this is where I think the international thing in terms of Malaysia, Singapore, people are looking at Malaysia, Singapore more closely now because uh, these are very unusual hybrid states. At one time, people thought that it's a model. And even today, if you go to China, a lot of the Chinese uh, uh, CNA people are said that Singapore is a potential model for the next transformation of the Chinese Communist Party. 
you know, you can grant people complete uh, uh, economic freedom and you grant them or make them think they have, uh, you know, political freedom when in fact everything is controlled from behind the scenes. So that's where, where Malaysia is now. But generally speaking, my impression speaking to people around the world is that the one MDB thing has really damaged uh, Malaysia's credibility around the world, especially among the, the, the uh, financial community. And I think it will take many, many years for Malaysia to uh, recover its credibility uh, if it does undertake uh, fundamental uh, reforms to the economy and uh, key institutions. I think what we're looking for, and I'm sure I speak on behalf of my two other panelists, that uh, one of the things in Malaysia is to become more democratic. You really need uh, core institutional reforms, not only in the judiciary, but in the civil service and all the other key institutions. Because what happened was after the long period of Barisan national rule, uh, they have corrupted all the institutions of the state. And, uh, and if you do not, uh, you know, if you do not reform these institutions, uh, I think it doesn't matter if the people go to the street, even if they want to demand for more democracy, if the institutions can't react to the demands of the people, we will be back to square one. Yeah, very important point. Um, although I would I would add that uh, when talking about sort of political uh, upheaval and, and thinking about Australia and Malaysia's relationship, of course, Australia is not uh, is quite used to its own revolving door of, of political leadership as well. Uh, but Amrita, I might ask the, the next. It's not quite a question that's been put in here, but uh, there, there is a, a statement here around the historic and current views of the ethnic Chinese minority in Malaysia, and I'm wondering whether you have a comment to make about that? I guess so. I mean, like uh, the other question, I guess what I'll do is I'll try and frame it in terms of the debate. Um, so, you know, I don't really know if I'm being asked about views that ethnic Chinese hold or views that are held about ethnic Chinese. So let, let's do it this way. Um, essentially, there's in Malaysian and Malayan and Malay politics have required a Chinese threat since at least the 1920s. They, they revolve around a Chinese threat. That Chinese threat is usually internal to society in the sense that, you know, there are Chinese Malayans and, and now Chinese Malaysians li living inside that society. They're the largest minority. Uh, and despite during the emergency, more than 20,000 of them being deported back to China and, you know, lots of them being rounded up and put into these things called new villages that were basically re-education camps. You know, there, there's, there's been quite a quite an experience there, right, with... Um, with the ethnic Chinese minority. And, and that experience has revolved around it being cast as, as a threat to racial, racial supremacy, Malay racial supremacy. And every time it is cast that way, um, well, that's, that's just basically a very effective thing to do because as I mentioned before, it's all part of that dynamics of making sure that Malay Muslim majority is permanently uh, able to view itself that way, able to identify with itself and with the, the salience of those two identity uh, categories. And it frankly is permanently mobilized. Um, and so if it's mobilized to vote a certain way, if it's mobilized to act a certain way, um, then it can be called upon uh, to do so, preferably in the service, especially of, um, you know, maintaining the, the power of whoever ends up being the one Malay party, if that's even possible anymore. So that's the way the Chinese minority and, and the kind of the presence of the Chinese minority has functioned politically for, for a very long time. And I'll just point to the really interesting thing that Pakatan Harapan did when won the 2018 election, because aside from all, you know, all the other things it did that were interesting and, and uh, kind of historic and actually allowed for the first time for a government to fall, one really important thing they did was they externalized the Chinese threat. So essentially what they said to Malay Muslim voters is, okay, you know, if you, if you need a Chinese threat, we're going to give you one. And this time it isn't going to be your Chinese neighbors and workmates and, you know, kids down the street. Uh, it's going to be the People's Republic of China, which right now is the biggest threat, you know, out there in terms of, you know, the way China is cast and, and the kind of the international and domestic politics around China. So what they were able to do was connect the story of Naji and the one in DB corruption with the story of the China threat. So essentially they were able to say, stop blaming the DAP, look at Najib, you know, he's taken all this money out of the budget and now he's bringing in all these Chinese built and road projects and he's selling the nation to China. So you want a Chinese threat? He's the Chinese threat. And that worked. Uh, it kind of authorised people who were concerned about sovereignty and concerned about the security of the nation to vote against UMNO for the first time in their lives. So the effectiveness of that move, I think, is, um, you know, one that's like, it's just been such a such an artful move. I don't know if it can be repeated. I mean, the threat has now been re-internalized and that's the normal pattern. Uh, 
So, you know, things can happen once they can happen again. You know, there are creative ways that people can, I don't know, come up with competitive election campaigns, come up with, you know, competitive ways to push back. Um, I don't know if they'll work again, though. Now, we are on 6pm, uh, but I would like to sneak in one more question that I've, uh, that's been sitting in the Q&A box, and I'll direct it to Kirsten, because you mentioned that there's going to be, you know, new voters um, and voting for the first time. Uh, but there's a question here about the massive brain drain that's taking place. Uh, every Chinese Malaysian who can afford it is getting educated overseas and staying there after graduation, uh, and that this perhaps may not bode well for the future of Malaysia. Did you have any thoughts? Thoughts on that particular question? I think it's it's a it's a brilliant question. And if we weren't in a global pandemic where we it wouldn't be that easy to be an international student, I, I, I would say this is this is clearly the case. So for, for me, one of one of the issues is how is COVID going to be impacting those things? Because a lot of the Chinese Malaysian students were coming to Australia and we haven't had international students on our shores for, for quite some time. Um, whether the ones that are here now can, can extend their visas and stay is another really tricky problem that uh, uh, Australia is at the moment grappling uh, with, but that's, that's a, a side issue. <laughs> Uh, from from a perspective, uh, yes, there's there's always the risk that if the pendulum is swinging too far, um, that you will lose good people because they will. Um, avail themselves to the opportunities to go overseas, get an education and, and stay there. Um, I'm a best example of that, even though I didn't leave because a pendulum was swinging to in, into any race. Um, so brain drains are, are a real, real issue. And it is a matter then for, for the government also to see whether their previous policies of getting the non malays voters into their camps, and this is what the, the previous coalition did, right? They weren't only in power because of the Malay voters. Um, they also had uh, voters from within the minorities and indeed some of the minorities parties were in the ruling coalition as well. So it becomes a question on how are they going to be positioning themselves towards these minorities voters and able to mobilize them to, to vote for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for. I would like to thank our panellists, James, Amrita and Kirsten, for a really rich and fascinating discussion. Um, I've certainly learned a lot uh, and it's just really terrific to be able to unpack very complicated uh, trends and, and shifts in, in political allegiances uh, with you. So thank you and thank you as always to our audience uh, for tuning in and for asking such excellent questions questions. Our next scheduled La Trobe Asia webinar is Surviving COVID-19 and a Military Coup as a Garment Worker. Uh, and that is next Tuesday as part of the Women in Asia conference. Uh, Kirsten uh, is co-organising that conference and we at La Trobe Asia are really delighted to be able to support that. Uh, so that public event will be taking place on Tuesday, the 23rd of November at 5.30pm AEDT. Uh, in the meantime, please follow us on tw uh, Twitter at La Trobe Asia or join our mailing list to find out more details for online events and La Trobe Asia publications. But thank you again. Thanks for hosting. Thank you thank so you. much for hosting. <laughs> thank thank you. you so much.